Hello, everyone. We're pleased to have you join us for Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Welcome to today's live broadcast, From Diagnosis to Treatment, the story of a breast cancer patient, microtomy to special stains. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by LICA. LICA Microsystems is a world leader in microscopes and scientific instruments. Founded as a family business in the 19th century, the company's history was marked by unparalleled innovation on its way to becoming a global enterprise. For more information, please visit www.lycabiosystems.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This presentation has been approved for continuing education credit. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner of the auditorium. This will direct you to the next necessary site and form needed to receive your credits. This webcast was designed to be interactive as well, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Jennifer Birch. Jennifer became a certified HG in 1994. She has 16 years of experience in various pathology laboratory roles, including general histology, IHC, animal research, orthopedic research, and neuropathology. She has held positions at the University of Rochester as well as Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She has attended numerous workshops and conducted lectures at state, regional, and national levels within the National Society for Histotechnology. Ms. Birch has several publications in various industry journals and has served on the Board of Directors for NSH from 2008 to 2014. She joined LICA in 2009. I'll now turn it over to Jennifer for her presentation. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're talking about diagnosis and treatment in breast cancer patients, second part of the series. Um, I'll go ahead and say right now that although we've entitled it Microtomy to Special Stains, there's not going to be a, a whole lot, actually not really any content that's directly related to special stains, simply because the majority of the diagnostic tests that we see are falling under immunohistochemistry these days. So this is more or less just a placeholder in the process to tell you where we'll start and stop our discussions today, but I did want to let you know that right up front. We'll review the objectives that most of you have probably seen when you registered for this course, but if you didn't, here they are. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about safety and ergonomics in microtomy, and then we'll also talk about some sectioning tips, and then we'll cover just a refresher of the basic chemistry of H&E staining. You know, so many of us, um, as Jolanda mentioned, have been doing this for several years, uh, such as I have. We don't necessarily think of it on a day-to-day -day basis. We get busy, we load the stainer, we're making sure everything's high quality. We don't really think back to why things work the way they work, so we'll just kind of brush over that and do a refresher of chemistry for H&E. And then we'll look at some slides of a quality H&E stain at the end. We're going to start off talking by er about ergonomics, and I will start by saying that I could do a three-hour talk just on ergonomics. In fact, I have done that. So this is definitely a 30,000-foot uh, view of what we talk about and what we think about when we think about ergonomics and microtomy specifically in the lab. Um, and generally, one way to think about ergonomics, as a simple diagram points out, is fitting the task and the environment to the worker rather than putting the worker in a situation where they have to adapt themselves and work in an area that's not comfortable for them or not appropriate and eventually subject, subjecting themselves to potential injury. So our goal is to not do that. And when we think of ergonomics, we think of four different areas. We think of things we have to look at are people. We have to look at the actual movements that they're doing. We have to look at the environment in which they're doing these tasks. And then finally, the very important part of ergonomics is the alternatives and what can we do to make things better for these people. And ergonomics, the actual word, comes from the Greek meaning work and laws. So we want to find ways to make 
people's work suit them better so that they can do it more safely and more efficiently. And specifically, when we're talking about people, some things to consider are obviously height. A seven foot tall person and a four foot tall person are not going to be comfortable at the same bench. And um, that's one of the more obvious ones. Strength would be another one. Some instruments, whether they're older or just by design, may require more force to operate. And if somebody doesn't have a lot of strength, whether it be hand strength or general strength, that could present a problem for them and make it challenging. Uh, dimension, meaning although two people may be five foot five inches tall, one of them may have significantly longer arms than the other, um, you know, longer torso, all those sorts of things. So just looking at somebody's height and giving them, oh, you're tall, go sit at the tall bench is probably not the best idea. Um, and of course, disabilities. There are some things that just people, because of their nature, cannot do and are unable to do, and we need to be mindful of that and either find uh, an alternative actual task or a way to work around any disabilities. Second, we need to look at the movement, the force that's required to do what you're doing. Um, if it's something that's just very, uh, if it's a wheel that's very hard to turn, that's something that we shouldn't just ignore and keep saying, well, that's just how that instrument is. Um, you want to just think about how hard the actual action is for the person that's doing it. Number two is probably one of the biggest ones, and that's repetition. The more you do the same activity over and over again for long periods of time on a long-term basis, the more you're subject to injury because you're working those same muscles um, and specifically the tasks that use small muscles versus large muscles. Um, that leaves us open for more injury and risk of potential injury down the road. And then range of motion. Um, as humans, we are meant to have so much range of motion in all of our joints and with a good posture. And once we get out of that zone, then we open up ourselves for potential injury. So we want to be mindful of, am I really meant to be leaning over to the left, stretching as far as I can stretch every two minutes to reach this? That's what we want to be thinking of. Um, in the environment, the first one there is social. And uh, one of the big ones that I see specifically in histology labs is the pressure that not even necessarily the management tells us, it's just what we feel. There's 2,000 blocks, three people out sick. My kids have a recital tonight. I, you know, I need to get these blocks done. I'm not going to take a break. I'm not going to go to lunch. And I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to cut all day. Um, that, you know, that social pressure uh, is one thing that can really subject us to potential injury because it becomes too easy to just do that on a regular basis and not take care of ourselves. Um, and also the physical conditions. Uh, if a room is too cold or too hot, you could be uncomfortable. And um, when you're not comfortable, you tend to ne not necessarily have your best working postures and do things in a way that you're being the most efficient. So we need to look at physical conditions in the laboratory as well as the obvious things of counter heights and that sort of thing. Um, and the last but definitely not least would be the alternatives. So once we've had an ergonomic evaluation or even an informal one and you find all these things or where you need to make changes, we need to come up with different ways to make it better, whether that's different motions, like is there just a different way to do it, um, or different activities themselves. Can we change this task? Can we take this job away and you know, put it on an instrument or you know, do something different to make us not even have to do the activity anymore? And of course, equipment. As things age and get older and are requiring more force or there's new advances that are ergonomic, do we need to look at different equipment? Some more things specific to microtomy. Uh, I mentioned repetition being the leading cause of microtome and those sorts of uh, ergonomic and repetitive motion musculoskeletal injuries. Some of the things that are prone to causing that would be the coarse feed wheel, which is the wheel on the left of a manual microtome, which we put you know, each block in and we turn that wheel. And that is one we're using small muscles in our hands and wrists to do that often. Of course, the sectioning hand wheel, we have to turn that to make our sections. And I read somewhere that people can do up to on an average of 10,000 turns a day. So that's a lot. That's definitely repetition. Um, cassettes in and out of the clamp is something that people don't really think about, but um, if you think it, you have to put the cassette in and you have to take it out, and sometimes there's a lot of tension on there because there has to be because we want it in there securely. So that is something that if you're just using you know one finger or two fingers, that could put you at risk for injury. 
um, picking up slides, using forceps, brushes, all of those things. We do it you know, hundreds of times in, in a day when we're cutting blocks. Um, and then workstation design can lead to awkward postures and movements. Sometimes, you know, all of a sudden, oh, we need another workstation, and there's nowhere else to put it, so it gets, you know, set on a counter somewhere, and you have, you're expected to sit there and cut in an awkward posture. And the last one is a big one in histology labs today. We have increased workload, decreasing staff, long, and that leads us to longer sessions without a break, and just wanting to get the work out and do a good job, and people tend to put themselves last and not take mini breaks or stretching breaks. So we're going to talk just for a minute about specifically the um, sectioning because one of the most common concerns are things like uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, tendonitis, things of the hand and wrist. And I mentioned just briefly that when we're using just the small muscles that in our body, it makes it more of a strain than if we're using a large muscle group at the same time. And the other part of that is we want our body to be at neutral position or neutral posture as much as possible, not even at work, but at, at rest or at play as well. So the neutral position of the wrist would be straight from the elbow and the arm forward and not to the left or to the right. And this picture, or the, the man has his hand up and his wrist is bent. This is definitely not the neutral position of the wrist nor is this, it's up in the air, and so many times we all tend to put our elbow on the table and just kind of turn the wheel with our hand and our wrist, and that puts us very far out of neutral position for our wrist. So we want to try to avoid do, doing that, and we want to cut more like this, neutral position of the wrist. You can see the forearm is straight, go right into the wrist, into the hand with no flexion or extension of the wrist. So if you're sectioning manually, you want to try to keep your arm like this gentleman in the photo. Uh, or the other option is automation, and this is something that more and more labs are moving towards as ergonomics becomes a focus. We can't take everything out, and we can't take all of the risk out. We have to still put our blocks in the chuck, but if we can reduce the sectioning or the course advance wheel, and that reduces some of the strain on our hands and wrists, then that removes one of the risk factors. In our next diagram here, we talk specifically on the top left, you'll see, um, if you imagine this as your workstation, you see each arm has a darker gray zone, which is the primary work zone, which overlap in the middle directly in front of the user. Where they overlap is a good place for all of your uh, up-close work, highly detail-oriented. And if you picture your, yourself with a microtome in this space, knowing how large a microtome is, you could very easily, depending on your arm length, be out of your primary work zone just turning the wheels. So this is why, you see our first bullet here mentions a U or an L-shaped workstation. That helps keep things closer to your body because what it does is it moves the user forward and it takes this range of motion for this arm and it extends it more. So that would get us more into, have us more, give you more area to work in your primary work zone. We also, as you see, have a secondary work zone and that's for the things that you don't use as much and then anything that's back here is with the tertiary work zone or things you seldomly access. And how many of us, because there are 10 of us lined up on a bench, only have three feet of space to the width, but we have a nice long, there could be a long bench and we've got all kinds of stuff sitting back here that we're reaching for every two minutes. And we really want to try to avoid that. So if you could get a URL-shaped workstation, that would help. And the second point on here is the height adjustable surface to accommodate different users. We see this more in new labs that are being designed because of the importance of ergonomics. They have counters that can be adjusted higher or lower based on the task and on the user. Um, but I do know that you know, in a majority of labs still today, there are still labs that you know, there's multiple shifts, three people a day using one microtome and that sort of thing. And it's not the easiest to change the height of the counter or the bench. So that brings us to number three, which is the sturdy adjustable chair to help with the posture. If you can't adjust the height of the workstation, then you need to look at the chair because our goal with our posture is to look like we do over here on the right with our head, neck, shoulders, spine, and pelvis all in a line with our hips at essentially a right angle, our knees, our ankles, and our elbows all at a right angle. That's about the best posture we can have to be seated. And so if you can't adjust the counter to get to this point, you need to be able to adjust the chair. It needs to be sturdy 
And the next point is you need to use a footrest if your feet don't touch the floor. If you have a higher counter and you've raised your chair so that you're in this position, you need a footrest, otherwise your feet are not going to be on the floor, and you don't want to put them under you on the chair ring like so many of us do because that takes away our right angles uh, of our ankles, our knees, and probably our hips because you're, and this is probably all going to lean forward if you put your feet on the ring of the chair. Uh, finally, on here, to keep yourself, your neck and shoulders relaxed as much as possible. Most of us carry some stress in our shoulders and neck by nature, and if you're tense, then that's going to put more strain on your muscles and stress your posture. And take mini breaks, even just two minutes to look up, look right and left, do a neck roll, um, just something to break that position that you've been in a static posture to give your muscles a break. And again, automate if possible. Anything you can automate helps reduce the risk and the wear and tear on your body. So we'll talk for a moment about breast tissue sectioning tips. I spoke with some pathologist friends when I was preparing this talk just to poll them and see what their most common complaints were. And generally, they all agreed that sections being too thick is a problem because they have trouble telling what is true dense chromatin and nucleoli from just a thick section with nucleus, and it makes it harder to interpret, and it just it's not as easy for them to tell at a, at a higher power view of what's going on in the section. Being too thin can also be a problem. It makes it appear that the stain has washed out, uh, but they said that thick tends to be the problem, and I personally think that we tend to err on the side of thickness because we're cutting fattier tissues, so you know when you're cutting something fatty, if it's fighting with you, you tend to bump up the microns a little bit. So I think that's what lends us to ending up with more thick than thin sections on breast. Uh, most of them, and pathologists I know, like their sections between four to six microns for routine breast tissue. And the last point on this slide is something that we, we know in our mind but we don't necessarily think or talk about, is that what you set on the microtomer is not always what thickness you will get of the section. You know you've all probably seen thick and thin sections or, and that sort of thing. And this is why the histotechnologist who is experienced and is used to working with their particular paraffin in their lab is just so valuable to the process because this is the most important point in the operation to be able to tell the thickness of the section. It doesn't have to be exact, but you can look at the section and tell if something is twice as thick as it should be or not, not as thick as it should be when it's on the water bath here. And this is why we need quality histologists to be able to look at the section and know, well, I, I don't want to pick this one up, it's too thin. This one's perfect, I'm going to take this one. And we give our pathologist the best possible section for diagnosis. This is another tip. Um, it actually is probably more helpful in other tissues than in breast, but you can get large, dense sections when we're cutting breast, so I wanted to include this um, just for something to be mindful of. The cutting force when we're cutting, if you think about it, the block comes down onto the microtome blade. So the force is coming from the bottom of the block and moving upward. And with that in mind, if you put the block in vertically, as this first picture does here, your clamping surfaces are going to be the bottom, which is straight, and then the small angled top portion at the top. So they're not exactly the same, and this portion is not quite as stable. It's still stable, and mind you, I know that you know, you're probably all thinking, well, I always cut like that. Um, lots of places do. But if you're having trouble, something that you can try is to turn it sideways and have two parallel, even square surfaces for clamping that can give you a more stable clamp. If you're having thick and thin or vibrations with larger dense tissues, just try turning it that way. Sometimes that will help. Um, again, that's you know, usually more helpful with bone or something that's harder, but it can be effective for breast tissue. And we'll talk just um, a, a reminder of some of the things that can affect the uh, quality of our sections. The thickness and the quality both can depend on all of these things, the temperature of the room and the block, the thickness of the trimming, the angle of the blade, depending on the paraffin. Some paraffins have different polymer mixes and the compression can be greater or lesser depending on another paraffin. And then, of course, the sectioning speed. We'll talk a little bit about room and block temperature. Most of us have uh, experienced what it's like if the room gets a little too hot, the paraffin doesn't like to cut. The cool room is ideal for the paraffin to cut. And the optimum temperature depends really on the embedding media and on the tissue. 
And when we, the reason that we chill tissue blocks to make them colder is because it makes the tissue and the wax homogeneous and it cuts better when they are more of the same consistency than a soft, warm wax and a hard piece of tissue. And then when we use warm water, that will soften the specimen. And although we don't really use it with breast tissues, sometimes we can. If there's a piece of, that has a lot of calcifications or has been a little bit overprocessed, we can use the warm water on the breast blocks just like we do on the GIs and the other samples in the lab. The preferred way of chilling blocks is with moist ice. It gives you both some water to hydrate and the cool. And we like to say that you should avoid chilling the block with the aerosol coolant just because it's easy to overdo it and then you get a cracked block and cracked tissue. So if you do use the cooling spray, which I know a lot of people do, um, use short bursts to, present, to prevent cracking of the block. Soaking of the block. And this is something, again, that we don't really do a lot of with breast tissue, but we can. So we'll just touch on it and remind ourselves of why we do that. And it's mainly to restore, restore moisture to over dehydrated specimens. Breast tissue t being primarily fatty tissue by nature doesn't necessarily need soaked as much as some other tissues. But if you give it brief exposure to water and ice, then you'll rehydrate the next few sections. Of course, if you soak it too long, then you're going to expand the cut surface of the block and then you can lose tissue because the tissue will swell. And when you look at the block, your tissue will actually be protruding out further than the wax. So when you start to cut, you're going to be getting tissue instead of wax for a while. So we want to be mindful of that and not expose it to water for too long. And then the last one on here, Proper processing obviously is the key, and you, we learned about that in the first installment of this series. And one thing I will say with breast tissue in particular, with the strict guidelines that for our processing and fixation for IHC, we really don't see, in my opinion, from what I, when I've talked to different labs, we don't see the wild variation that we do with some other tissues because people can only tweak the fixation portion and the processing so much because they have to stay within the parameters of those guidelines, which I think those were addressed in the first series and they'll probably be talked about more in the IHD series, so I'm not going to get into that. But it, it is something that you really don't see as much variation in breast tissue as you do in the other tissues in our lab that don't have such stringent guidelines across the board. And that, of course, reduces the need to soak or do any remedying if we have proper processing in the first place. The next one is trimming thickness, and this is something that most of us don't think of affecting our sections. In our mind, we're thinking, I'm throwing all these sections away so I can go as fast as I want instead of as thick as I want, and I'm just going to go like crazy. But aggressive trim a trimming makes a moth hole effect, which you may have seen, on the subsequent sections, and it can vary with how far into the block it goes. With breast tissue tending to be soft, the moth hole effect can go in several sections. And so that's something we want to be mindful of. And something that I just recently learned is that the appearance of tightly rolled up sections when you're trimming can mean that you're trimming too thick. If they're very, very tight little rolls, then you're likely trimming too thick. And that's whether you're doing the old-fashioned, as I call it, rocking technique or using a, a trim function and just setting your microns higher, higher and rotating the sectioning wheel. Either way, you can get those tightly rolled up sections and that means you're sectioning too thick. Um, and then large samples, you really should trim in thinner and slower because you want to just be mindful of not chunking out that specimen. And even with breasts, you know, if we get one that has a calcification and, it, and it's large and fills almost the whole cassette, you, you know, don't want to be trimming in really rapid and thick because you can lose that tissue. And ideally, you want to do trimming at 30 to 50 microns less if you can get away with it. Sectioning thickness and speed is one that we are more mindful of because these are the actual sections we're going to collect. And the rate at which we cut will directly affect the thickness and the quality. And if you cut too fast, you will invariably compromise the quality of the section. Maybe not every time, but you leave yourself open to more variability the faster you go. When you cut too fast, we're creating heat because of the friction of the block going over that blade so frequently, we're warming up the block face and the sections become thicker. 
And it may not even be that you notice it because you are going so fast and you're only taking four sections, but they will get thicker as they get warmer because the paraffin likes to cut when it's cold. And some other things that ex excessive speed can cause would be compression, thick and thin, Venetian blind, and that's largely because extreme speed cutting can cause a lot of vibration in the blade holder and even in our block holder, and that gives us some variation in our sectioning. So now we'll review the chemistry of H&E, &E. and again, this is another thing. We could talk about different H&E stains and things of how they work all day long, uh, but in the interest of time, this is just a little refresher, and maybe we'll think of some things we haven't thought of in a while. Deparaffinization, of course, we start out with tissues that are in wax. We want to put them in a dye, and we ultimately want to have them um, able to pass light through and be evaluated by the pathologist. So we need to get the wax out, and we do that with, with xylene traditionally. Uh, there are substitutes out there that do a great job that are a little more uh, environmentally and user-friendly than xylene. If you're using xylene, you can usually get away with three changes for one to two minutes. The substitutes generally are more gentle and need a little bit more time. We want to make sure we get all the wax out of there. Uh, if we leave wax in our sections, we'll have variability in our staining and our pathologist won't be able to make the diagnosis. And one thing that I think is important in today's uh, fast-paced histology lab is to be able to come in if the stainer has crashed and take the sections out and look at them and say, okay, where was this section in the process? If you can't tell electronically, to look at the section and know. So at this stage, the, um, the sections will be clear, uh, and that has to do with the refractive index of xylene and the other clearance. It's, the same, it's similar to that of the protein in our tissues. So after we go through that, they will appear clear at this point instead of white as they were when we put them on the stainer or in our hand staining. So after we've gotten out the wax, we need to hydrate the tissue because our primary nuclear dye, hematoxylin, is aqueous. So we need to have an aqueous environment for that hematoxylin to work appropriately. We want to get that water out. So we go through 100% alcohol to get the xylene or the substitute out of the tissues, and then we go through graded water to uh, gradually put water back, uh, graded alcohols to gradually put the water back in. And that varies from place to place depending on your tissue type and, you know, your staining protocol. Some people don't use a 70. Um, generally, the more gradual of the grading, the more gentle it is on your tissues. If you were to, for example, go from xylene to 100% to running water to hematoxylin, you would likely lose a lot of tissue because that's just harsh on the tissue. You're putting, you're more or less shocking the tissue. And all, if you remember, we just have a piece of tissue on a glass slide. So um, the gradual grading of the alcohols is gentle on the tissue and helps us introduce the water with less loss of tissue happening. And then we do a running water step to get all the alcohol out of there because, again, we want to get to an aqueous state for the hematoxylin. Now we'll actually talk about hematoxylin for a little bit. Um, hematoxylin is the oxidized product of hematin, which is a natural dye. By itself, it doesn't really have affinity for staining. If you just had plain hematoxylin powder, it, it will stain a little bit, but not the way we want it to as our main nuclear dye. So we combine it with metallic salts, which are mordant, and that reacts with the stain and it forms an insoluble precipitate. If you don't have the mordant, it won't connect the dye to the tissue the way it does in our stains. So we need that mordant. And hematoxylin is widely known as one of the best nuclear stains. There's a few main types that we'll just touch on briefly. Harris and Mayer are two of the most common, and those continue to oxidize and should be filtered. Now, I do know that there are commercial preparations out there that have been able to be formulated that you don't need to filter them if you're changing them often. So I know if you may be thinking, well, I use a Harris and I don't have to filter it. Obviously, if you saw precipitate, you would filter it, but um, there are commercial preparations out there that do not need to be filtered, even though they are a Harris and a Mayer. And then the last one on here is Gills, which oxidizes very slowly and generally doesn't need filtering. It's a good choice for labs that are low volume and want to get a lot of use out of there but don't really want to fil filter their hematoxylin every day. Gills is commonly used there. Uh, the chemistry of hematoxylin, it's a basic dye. It carries a positive charge. So that's why it's attracted to the negative charges of the chromatin in, our nu in the nucleus, which is the DNA and the RNA. So we have the positive charge of the dye attracted to the negative charge of the nucleus, and that's what makes it such a strong nuclear, uh, nuclear stain. Uh, 
And there are also covalent bonds, which are strong. And here's just a little diagram of a covalent bond versus an ionic bond. And you see over here in the covalent bond when we're sharing electrons, how much is overlapped. And this is just a, a brief description of how strong the covalent bond can be. And that's one of the many reasons why hemotoxin is such a good nuclear stain. Uh, traditional staining methods, we'll talk about the regressive method first. So in regressive staining, you're going to overstain with hemotoxin. Harris is the most common. We stain everything. And we, if, it was, if we rinse it, it's not going to rinse off. That's the way it, we've overstained it, and it's going to stay that way until we do something about it. So after we wash, we need to put it in a mild acid solution that's going to take out the excess hemotoxin. So ideally, you're overstaining everything, and then you're going to take out what you don't want. And that's why people, you know, once you've found your staining um, protocol for your facility, you generally don't make major changes to it if you're using a regressive staining method because you've found just what pulls out enough stain to get to the desired staining intensity. And then we need to wash to get that acid out of there. So uh, we'll go through a wash step. And we need to put them in bluing after that because they're going to be reddish, purplish color after we go in the acid. And we need to get them back to the blue, the blue or purple color that the pathologist is used to seeing. We're going to take just a little break here and talk specifically about differentiation in bluing. So in theory, differentiation is when the acid alcohol attacks the tissue mordant and the di mordant dye linkages that we made and we made those, insolu those insoluble connections. When we put the acid into that equation, it unlinks that. And that's what able enables us to get out the excess hematoxylin that we don't want in parts of our tissue. But then we need to be mindful of when we put it in the acid pH, that hematin, when it becomes soluble, it also becomes red. And so the sections are a reddish, purplish kind of color. And the pathologist won't be really happy if we give him those to diagnose. And that's why we use a bluing reagent at this point. And that's usually an alkaline solution, um, a lithium, something like that. Because when we're at an alkaline pH, the mordant dilate reforms again, so then we again have an insoluble blue color. And what was an overstained dark purple site now is the nice crisp blue-purple color that we want for our nuclei. And then in the progressive method, Gills is the most common hematoxylin used for that. We're going to selectively stain the nuclear material, so we're only going to stain it as dark and as intense as we want to see. We're not going to overstain. And then you don't have to use an acid alcohol. Um, I will say that I know a lot of people use a very dilute acid alcohol even in their progressive stain, and that's primarily to clean up extraneous stain that might be on the slide. It's not a de-staining, so to speak. But if you have ever noticed a purple sheen on your slides when they come out of hematoxylin, that can happen with gills. And so some people will quickly use just a brief dip in an acid alcohol, and it's usually more uh, dilute and weaker than what we would use in a regressive stain. But in case you're just looking at my two bullets and saying, well, I know I use gills and I know I do a dip in acid alcohol, that's generally why. It's usually just to clean up any background stain and not necessarily to de-stain your tissue. And then after the hematoxylin and gill slides are washed and then generally put in bluing to deepen the blue-purple color, um, generally washing them in running water long enough would blue them, but most of us don't have that kind of time, so we use a bluing reagent and progressive staining as well. Uh, of course, after that, we need our counter stain, and our, we're going to talk about eosin and our H&E. Counter stains in general are secondary dyes that enhance the visibility of the primary dye without obscuring it. So if you think about the things that we use in histology today as some, sec some counter stains, nuclear fast red, metanol yellow, fast green, those sorts of things, they're all more gentle light colors that when put with the primary dye, enhance it but don't distract from it. And if you've ever done a stain and your counter stain doesn't work of any kind, whether it's an iron stain or, or an H&E, even though the primary stain still stains as it always had, it can markedly change the appearance of your stain overall. So that's so it's so important to have our counter stains at the right intensity because our pathologists are used to looking at a certain balance of the primary stain and the counter stain, and we want to make sure that we give them that, that same balance as often as possible. So eosin is usually typic, is typically, typically an alcoholic formulation. 
So once we come out of bluing, we need to get back to an alcoholic state because, again, it's easier for our tissue if everything, if we go from like to like. So we want to go back into alcoholic state. And we usually do that with a rinse in 95 before we go into the eosin. Now, there are aqueous solutions of eosin out there. And if you're using one of those, you don't need to go into 95 first. But the majority of them are usually al alcoholic, so we would go through 95 and into eosin. But both e eosins that are alcoholic and aqueous work very well, so whichever you're using um, is totally fine, and you should stick with it. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about the uh, chemistry of the hematoxylin, and then so when we think about eosin, it's acidic, and it has a negative charge, and it has affinity to the cytoplasm. So that's the reason why it stains our cytoplasm so well. So after we've got all of our dyes on, we are going to dehydrate. And this is, again, because we're talking about getting to a point where we can permanently mount this section for diagnosis and archival. And we need to get the water out of there. And so and we need to get the, the, the alcohol out of there. So we go through a series of alcohols from 95 into 100%. Some people do like more of the 100% than the 95, and that's generally because we want to make sure that the 100% is absolutely 100% because it can cause problems if there's still water lingering in there, especially if you're using a xylene substitute. Xylene substitutes are generally not forgiving at all of water content. Xylene itself doesn't like water, but xylene substitutes are much more um, finicky about that. And something that's important to be mindful of is you may not even notice a problem right away. You may cover slip your slides and they may look fine. But if there was water in there that was not removed because the 100% weren't clean, you can find problems weeks to months later. You can find your tissue is starting to fade or the eosin is bleeding out. And that generally comes from not enough dehydration and having water in there when we cover slip those slides. And then we just want to make sure we, again, rotate and change frequently to make sure that all the water is removed and that we're using true absolutes at the end. And then we're going to clear our slides. Uh, we're going to use xylene or a substitute because those are what are missable with our permanent mountains, which is our end goal here. And so, the, the, again, we talked about it earlier that the xylene renders the tissue clear and transparent due to the refractive index being similar to the protein in the tissues. And what we want is for the pathologist to be able to easily pass light through our section and evaluate our tissue components that we have stained. So we want our tissue to be clear. Um, some people I read call it de-alcoholization agents. Um, I don't call it that because I can barely pronounce that. But um, that is, if you hear somebody say that, they're talking about clearing agents. And they are, if we're not going to permanently mount, if it's a frozen section and we don't want to, then we um, will not clear. You can go from water to an aqueous mountain and not need to go through clearing. But for general routine staining and archival, we're going to go through the clearing step. Okay, so now we're gonna look at some slides. And I will start this section by saying I am not a pathologist, but um, I did uh, take some slides for us of some normal and a few of breast cancer to just show you um, how important our good sectioning and staining is uh, to the process and just remind ourselves of the, the beautiful work that we do. Um, and just I'm going to touch on just a little bit of uh, some structures and that sort of thing, but it's definitely not an all-encompassing discussion of these things, and you'll get more of this in the next us in this series. So when you think about the breast, the breast has a branching system of ducts that lead down from the nipple. There's approximately 12 large ducts that emerge from the breast as lactiferous ducts. And those ducts branch repeatedly and ultimately form what's called the terminal duct lobular unit. And that's what we're looking at on our slide here. The tissue between the ducts and the glands, which is the bulk of the volume of the adult breast, is composed of fat and fibrous tissue, and that varies in proportions um, based on different things, um, such as hormones and just the person in general. And the generic name given to everything that is in between the glands is called stroma. You've probably heard that term before. Um, stroma in any organ is essentially the connective tissue framework that doesn't perform the function of the organ. So in this case, the function of the breast being to produce milk for the infants, 
the stroma is the connective tissue framework that doesn't perform that function. So um, when we look at this, we see our glands and then we see our stroma. So that's the general normal um, tissue here. The, uh, again, the amount of glandular tissue is dependent on hormonal activity and can fluctuate with the menstrual cycle and then with, or with pregnancy or with age. Uh, the ducts and the glands are lined. You can see in the higher power picture on the bottom, they are lined by two layers of epithelium, which is supported by a basement membrane. Most diseases of the breast affect the ducts and the glands, and carcinomas arise from the epithelial cells that line the structures. So that's what we are looking at down here. It's, I don't know how, well, how far we can zoom in, but they, we can see the epithelial cells lining the glands here. So this is a slide from a normal breast in late pregnancy. So you can see the expansion of the TDLUs. You can see that the epithelium starts to accumulate some fat droplets over here. Um, you can see that there's some vacuoles in the cytoplasm of the cells. And then the, it looks like the non-specialized stroma has diminished. And that's because of the expansion of the TDLUs are taking up more of the space and they're crowding the, the tissue. And this is, again, this is normal and this is the um, late pregnancy. So by contrast to that, we also have a slide uh, from postmenopausal. So this is a lobule that is set in non-specialized stroma and you see just a general reduction in glandular tissue and relatively increased stroma. And the epithelial and the myoepithelial cells are smaller, and there can be areas of fibrosis, and we can also see benign calcifications, although we don't really see them in this section. But you can just see the marked difference between uh, normal premenopausal and postmenopausal in the glands versus stroma. And this is a good, um, this slide here is a good indicator of a nice eosin stain, really evident in our stroma. So the next slide is benign microcalcifications. Um, the actual diagnosis of this core biopsy was epocrine metaplasia, and what that means is that the glands, the epithelium, start to resemble sweat glands. And up here you can see they kind of look like you see sweat glands. Um, this is commonly seen in fibrocystic disease of the breast. And these are phosphate microcalcifications right here. And as histotechs, I know the majority of you looked at this and you all saw the knife mark. And that's when you thought about what it would be like to cut this tissue. Um, that's generally the difference if you sit down with a pathologist to look at a slide of the histotechnologist looking at it versus the pathologist. Our first thought is to look and see the knife marks and they're you know, seeing the apocrine metaplasia. Um, but this is just to show you um, the staining and when we do have any kind of calcifications like that, they tend to be very dark and very dense. And again, we can see just the nuclear details very good in our staining. So even though we have knife marks, that's somewhat to be expected when we have those calcifications. And again, that was benign. So now we'll do a few slides of um, some cancers. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, DCIS means that the cancer is confined within the ducts. It's usually visible on mammograms and can be detected there. And uh, it's classified by nuclear grading, so that's important to us because we want to make sure we're giving good quality nuclear staining uh, with our hematoxylin. And it can extend into the ducts, so that's one thing to consider. But uh, this slide is a grade one, and so the the features that make it a grade one, a grade one, are that the nuclei are monotonous. They look largely alike. There's not a variation in size or shape. And the size of the nuclei is 1.5 to 2 red blood cell diameters. And there's fine chromatin and an occasional nucleoli, but largely not in most of the cells. And um, so the second one that we have here is an intermediate grade. And I apologize, I only have one magnification on this one because a lot of people don't photograph them and that I asked for some help with my images here. Um, and so this, the way that they determine what's an intermediate grade is actually it's not a grade one and it's not a grade three. So um, and here we start to see some different shaped nuclei in our cells. We see a few more nuclei. Um, 
and some more coarse chromatin, and they're a little bit bigger, but not large, not a lot bigger than what we saw in the low grade. And so here's our high grade, and it's called a high grade comedo. Comedo is referring to this area of necrosis over here that we see. Um, often, you know, when we would, if we'd be QCing this slide as a, as a histotechnologist, we might think that that was something that fell off, uh, or we, you know, we had some sort of an artifact there, but it's actually um, some necrosis. And um, that happens because when it's an aggressive cancer and the cancer cells grow quickly, some of those cells don't get enough nourishment, and then those starved cells start to die off, and we get the areas of necrosis, and that's why this is called a comedotype. But the things that actually make it a grade three DCIS, just for some interesting facts here, um, they're pleomorphic nuclei, so we have all kinds of different shapes, and you can see those over here. Um, and then we see some coarse chromatin. We see a lot more nucleoli. Um, and they're larger. The, di the uh, diameter, the size of the nuclei is 2.5 red blood cell diameters or larger in a grade three. And so if we were looking at this slide, I mean, what I'm mindful of is just how important a good quality section is, how important it is for the pathologist to be able to get to this level and to be able to see into the nuclei and evaluate the chromatin and the nucleoli and to have it all be in the same plane and just be crisp and clear. And that's why our job is so important and why we want to give them such a high quality nuclear stain with good cytoplasmic background. Uh, here's a picture of lobular carcinoma in situ. So that's, um, we see that the glands are expanded by a uniform population of lobular cells and you, they generally look the same and they're all with, and they're in the, in the lobules. And it can be confusing because um, LCIS can invade the ducts and DCIS can extend into the lobules. And so that's, you know, something that pathologists are always concerned with. But um, again, you can see that nuclear staining is so important and we have good ESN in our slides here. Um, and because it is confusing, that's why we get into the importance of IHC and immunohistochemistry. Um, and that's what we're, the next segment of this series will be when that happens, you'll um, get to learn more about just the different um, diagnostic tests that we have at our disposal now um, and that make it easier for the pathologist to distinguish exactly the distribution of the cancers. But um, this, it starts with us with our good quality sections and giving them a good baseline to start off with their ordering of those tests. And that concludes my prepared comments, and uh, I think we'll open up for questions now. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that, for that presentation. We're so happy to have you be part of the Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Before we get started on our um, question and answer session, I'm going to remind our audience how to submit their questions. Uh, for the audience, you can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And uh, we'll get to as many of those as we can. I'll just give you a, a few minutes to find that button and submit your questions for Jennifer um, on her presentation on microtomy and special stains. Okay, I see we don't have any today for Jennifer, but we'd like to thank her for being part of the Cardinal Lab Health Exchange and for our sponsor, Leica, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through October of this year, and you'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to all of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you again for being part of our presentation. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.